This is Polly, and I am now going to give you some dates for Chicago Dialogue Therapy Training. It's training for therapists who want to learn the Dialogue Therapy Method, which is the method that incorporates real dialogue plus a number of other features of evaluation and communication. It's for anyone interested in learning couples therapy and especially interested in learning dialogue therapy. Uh, And the first training in Chicago is November 7th through 10th, 2019. The second training is January 30th through February 2nd, 2020, April 2nd through the 5th, 2020, and May 14th through the 17th, 2020. These are all extended weekends. And together, these trainings result in about 85 hours of continuing education credit for mental health professionals. You can check on my website to see where the training will take place in Chicago. If you live close to Chicago or you want to make the commute, it's going to be actually a really lively training. And we've taken some time to set it up. And I know there are a lot of people interested in the Chicago area, but I would encourage anybody who's close by and interested in completing the training, getting certified in dialogue therapy, to check the website about the training in Chicago. Welcome to Enemies from War to Wisdom. Why do we need enemies? From intimate relationships to politics, tribalism, and community, we cannot seem to stop dehumanizing each other. Chronic conflicts in our families, societies, and nations seem inevitable. In this podcast, we analyze human hostilities from the most mundane to the most sophisticated. We apply psychology, psychoanalysis, art, spirituality, and relational theory in conversation about belonging and otherness. Each program will reach for a fresh wisdom that shows us how to step back from creating enemies in our lives. I'm your host, Eleanor Johnson, a videographer and artist with Emma Troop, an experimental theater group in New York City, and I am here with my co-host, Polly Young Eisendratt, who is a psychologist, Jungian analyst, author, and speaker. We approach our ideas each from our own worlds, but always from the spirit and teaching of Buddhism, of which we are lifelong practitioners. In today's podcast, we're going to be taking a look once again at what is the human self, Most of us find it's confusing to see, hear, feel the self. We sometimes believe it's inside our bodies or it's the same thing as our bodies. But the self is no thing. It does not exist as anything anywhere, but instead is an interactional process that we begin to practice when we are about 18 months old and have the experience that we are inside this body and the world is outside. That sets up the experience of I am and you are, and that is always a unitary self-other interactional process. In this podcast today, we will once again investigate that mysterious sense that we see, hear, feel as a thing called self. And then we'll take a look at why these assumptions make it easy to create enemies and defend ourselves in the face of emotional threat. Well, Polly, this is... (laughs) A big subject. So welcome and let's begin. Okay, Eleanor, and I knew from talking with you many times that you feel that it's hard for listeners to really get the idea that the self is a process and not a thing, that it's an interactional process with others, particularly other human beings, but it can be animals and other things as well that that interactional process is what we experience as a self. Because many people, and especially I think people who are very self-conscious, and many Western people are very competitive, very self-protective, and very self-conscious. And then I believe they tend to identify themselves or the self with the body. Like, this is myself, like the sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, as though somehow we are protected from something that's not physical. So that confusion between the self as the body 
is something that Freud noticed. He, he called the ego, the human ego, the body ego. He said, we identify that sense of being an individual self with our bodies. And of course, the Buddha way, way noticed it. You know, I mean, he basically created a lot, lot of practices to show you in your own experience that yourself is not located anywhere in your body. You know, like if you eliminate everything but the brain, is that yourself in the brain? And if it is, then when you see a bunch of brains in a laboratory, as His Holiness said, you must have a lot of feelings about those brains. But you don't, because there is no self in those brains. Those are organs, like other organs in the body. So where can you find the self? I mean, what would you say? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, one of the things that I'm really starting to recognize as I also, you know, listen to the podcast again is that we are bringing through uh, like a new template, a new new module Mm -hmm. in terms of looking at it from the Buddhist point of view. I think a lot of people associate, you know, getting rid of their ego Mm-hmm. In terms of, say, we say no self, well, they'll mm-hmm. think, you know, you've got to get rid of, you know, if you're taking the, a more conscious path or you're doing spiritual work, you have to get rid of the ego. Yeah. And then listening to our podcast, we're also saying that we want to get rid of the negativity, mm-hmm. the dysfunctional aspect of the ego. Yeah, I mean, it's not exactly getting rid of. I understand that people well, again, uh, they, people say it that yes. way, but like transcending it or recognizing it deeply with equanimity, these are all mm-hmm. ways of actually working with it. But yes, I think that, uh, so remembering that our podcast blends psychoanalysis right. with spirituality and right. especially buddhist spirituality it gives us an opportunity to look at the issues that surround the self what we call self and i'll, I'll define it in a minute but that also is different from what people call their egos right exactly. you know and ego again has a lot of different definitions right, right and so you know as i said a moment ago freud specifically said that the ego is your body it's your body that's the way you organize your and defend your sense of self but he didn't say that the ego was comprehensive of the self now jung carl jung obviously was very clear that the that the ego is not comprehensive of the self and so the self was something different from the body and i think that's like where we need to at least get started so you know what i'm calling the human self is the experience of being i'm going to have to say it like this it sounds it sounds, you know, philosophical. Being an individual subject, in other words, that you have the you have the impression that you do things, that you make things happen, that you say things, that you're free to actually do and say things, and that you perceive things, and you have the impression that you're doing that from some location, you know, from inside of something. Now, if you don't have that impression, you're either psychotic or you're a god. I mean, within the consensual world, within the world that we walk around in. So people feel that they're held by their body. Or by their point of view, even. You know, sometimes um, you know that, you know, in a crisis, like a car accident, when you're having a baby, you can pop out of your body. I I think that's Mm -hmm. not that unusual. I mean, I've popped out of my body a number of times in my life where I seem to be above my body. Uh, for me, I couldn't see anything. I could just hear. I know other people can see and hear when they pop outside. You know, I think that... I've popped outside. I've seen. You've popped outside <laughs> of your body. And so, you know, that, again, that sense that you're contained in your body, mm, you know it's not true because you popped outside. Right. So you yeah. know that you're not contained. And yet you habituate to this idea that you are contained in your body. So this idea... I'm going to flesh it out a lot more of being an individual subject. What does that mean? That means that you have the experience that you see things, that you hear things, that you feel things, 
and that you do those things from some point of view or location. It's not without location that you see here feel, right? And can you say more about location? Location is just like that you are somewhere okay. instead of okay. everywhere. Right, okay. You know, I mean, so, so either... Okay, that's a good point. <laughs> yes, it's like, like that you are somewhere, yes. you yeah. know. Now, sometimes we have the impression that we're nowhere, but usually that's when we're unconscious. So let's say that the, the choices are everywhere and somewhere. And uh, um, so, you know, I would say that we, generally speaking, experience ourselves as seeing, hearing, and feeling things both as though they are in the world, like we see a, what we call the world out there. Then we also see the images in our minds and we see the images in our dreams and we know those are mental images. We don't confuse those with the world out there. So we see out and we see in and we feel as though we're doing that, right? When we're doing that, <laughs> when we, we say, okay, so I can see the image in my mind of what I'm gonna have for dinner, or I can see the bush and the bird's nest out there. So that's one part of our subjective experience. Another part is hearing, and hearing as a, as a sense gate is the first one to be organized in utero. We know that, that infants inside, in the womb, can hear from about four months in utero on. They can distinguish their mother's voice from other kinds of things. So that means they have an organized perception of hearing something that's familiar and something that's not familiar. Obviously, they don't have language, they don't know anything, but they hear the sound, they hear the sound. So we can hear out, and what we hear when we hear out, and we've talked about this, is what we regard as sounds coming from the outside. And then those could be uh, words being spoken. And then we take them a step further and we actually apply them to our mental categories. But uh, when we hear out, we have that again, that impression that something is coming from outside. When we hear in, we hear the words and the noises or sounds that we're making inside. So for example, you hear in, you hear yourself talking to yourself. You may hear yourself rehearsing something or you may hear yourself commenting on something that's going on, or you can hear yourself um, planning and remembering, all of which uh, take a usually narrative form, although sometimes insights or intuitions just sort of pop in as a word or two, which you have to unpack then. But so hearing in, you hear what you regard as coming up inside of yourself. And also any sounds like, you know, if you practice hearing in as a meditation practice, you can hear the beating of your heart. It's not that hard to hear it, uh, but you know, most of the time we tune it out. And um, so seeing out, seeing in, hearing out, hearing in. The third category of subjectivity is feeling out and feeling in. When we feel out, we feel what is around us, what it seems to be around us, and the, the, like the air on our face, the clothes on our bodies, the floor that's under the feet, the chair that's under your butt, you know, whatever it is that seems to be on the outside where your body is in contact with it, you feel out into that. Now, it's possible without even too much meditational skill to feel a little ways out of your body, like I would say around 10 inches out into the, let's say, dynamics around you. So when people work on feeling the heart, the actual human heart as the focus of meditation, Cynthia Bourgeau instructs that as do some others in the Christian centering movement. So if you actually begin to feel your heart as an organ, you will notice that you can feel your heart beating, and you can feel a kind of dynamic about 10 inches out from your heart, your actual physical heart. And so sometimes when we're feeling out, we can feel a dynamic around what we call our body. You know, so we can feel beyond the actual skin into the atmosphere around it, unless you're really quite intuitive or 
very enlightened, you might not be able to feel, you know, 50 feet out. But I think certainly some Tibetan teachers who work with energies in the dynamic field, they feel out pretty long distance. So feeling out then is using these body sensations to get a sense of what's going on, as we call it, out there. And then feeling in, the way we're talking about it, is to feel your emotions. And your emotions are both kind of agitations and motivations. You know, they they're kind of motivate you to move towards something or to move back from it, to engage with it or to disengage. And while we, we say technically aggression, that reaction to threat is not a motivation, it, it acts in a similar way. It's more of like an instinct. Like if you're, if you're in danger, you're either going to fight or you're going to flee. And that's your instinct. And that's the dog's instinct. And that's the mouse's instinct. I mean, there are a lot of mammals that have the fight or flight instinct, but it also, that experience of fear for humans, we tend to feel that as an emotion. So the kind of primary emotions that we are, that are organized at birth, the joy and curiosity and fear and sadness and disgust get us to move towards or away from the world Uh, but at that point we don't experience the inside and the outside is different when we're when we're very young Uh, that has to get organized until about you know until you're about 18 months old you don't know for sure you're inside or there's something outside because of course the outside and the inside are never separated in your perceptions it's just that you've made the decision and to belong to the consensual world, you have to make this decision as a human being that you experience yourself as being inside of your body and you experience the world as being outside. So when we feel in to our emotions, we feel the centers in our nervous system, like typically people will feel it in the head between their eyebrows, where you can, you know, you can feel like you've got a headache because someone is giving you a headache or you feel it in your throat, or you can also get a pain in your neck from your throat where your throat is tightening up. You feel it in your solar plexus in that area, or sometimes in your heart, you'll feel a, an emotion, a feeling, or in your stomach, or in your lower intestines, your gut. So those centers are called chakras in the traditional Indian system, but we also recognize them in the Western understanding of the nervous system. These are, these are areas where the, there's a rich kind of confluence of nerve endings. And so when you feel in, you're feeling the movement of your own emotional life in what appears to be inside of you. So let's say that seeing out, seeing in, hearing out, hearing in, feeling out, feeling in, constitute this experience of being an individual subject, that that constitutes this thing that we call self, we experience that most of the time as though it's cut off from other selves. We go around in what I call like a snow globe in which you know, you're know you in your own mind, you're talking to yourself, you're hearing a few things, you're seeing some things, you're seeing things in your mind, you're feeling things, you're feeling out. So that kind of going around in a snow globe, that would be more like your ego. It's like it cuts you off from, you You defend it, you're like, you know, that's not the way I like it. I don't, I don't like the situation I'm in. And uh, the other thing you do in your snow globe your own subjective self, is that you have a lot of perceptions of other people, of what they're doing, how they're acting, why they're acting the way they're acting. You have, of course, a lot of opinions about animals too, but by and large, it's other people that disturb us. It's other people that we form really hostile relationships with. I mean, perhaps, you know, in the distant past when people, when Homo sapiens were at risk, Perhaps they felt this way towards tigers or bears, you know, that those were their enemies. But I do believe that we are naturally designed for human enemies. And that one very important reason is that we have these theories, these ideas, these ways of talking to ourselves about 
other well, people. You, you also talked earlier about the homo sapiens being the negative is more dominant than the positive. Absolutely. So that we've got more negativity that we have to kind of overcome to be able to access the, the more positive. Well, let's just call it a design feature that we, <laughs> that we are, we remember what doesn't work. Well, we notice what doesn't work, more what than. we don't like. Right. What seems out of place or out of whack, we notice that more than what does work, right. what we like. Right. And so we remember that more. Right. Consequently, we have negative theories about others and ourselves much more often than we have right. positive right. theories. Right. You know, like when I listen to my mind and I'm walking around on the streets in New York, for example, it's amazing how my mind, without me even wanting to hear it, criticizes other people's outfits you know it's like going along like oh my god that hairstyle she shouldn't wear those shoes you know look at that the way those jeans look on her you know and I'm not even saying that I mean there's just a blah 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 going on in there that's kind of making negative comments about other people's appearances and of course I notice it and so I can then not listen to it I can put it in the background but there are lots of things that people listen to in their minds. And many of those things today, I believe, originate from social media. They originate from all kinds of media that predispose us to be negatively occupied with the people who disagree with us. Right. It becomes you know. very fixed, frozen. Yeah. Right, right. You know, it, it, ha- it loses its fluidity and it's fixed. Well, it's like a tape that we're running, and the thing that maybe we notice is that it never changes. For example, the Donald Trump tape. You know, the tape that people run about Donald Trump, when people are running that tape, they never wake up in the morning and say, oh, look, he did something good. They just don't allow that. Well, it's hard to find. (laughs) Well, I think that's a problem. I I mean, I think that's a problem of being in your snow globe. Yeah. Because there is no person on Earth who doesn't do some good, nor is there any person here who doesn't change, nor is there any person that we could get the final say on. We're just not that smart. And so to get the final say. So if if Donald Trump in your snow globe always, always just does a bunch of stupid things, then you're not paying attention to Donald Trump. You're paying attention to your snow globe. And of course, it's exactly the same for our family members, our neighbors, the people who we depend on in various ways, we will run the same narrative, which is a hearing in narrative, where we hear in, we hear ourselves saying the same kinds of comments time after time after time. And so right away, we should check that because the nature of reality, which I believe everyone agrees with, whether they've ever or of Buddhism or not, is that it is impermanent. It is changing all, all, all of the time. Reality is never stuck. Right. It is never rigid. It is never repetitive. Right. So what is it get, that gets us all sort of right. stuck on the rigid and repetitive? It's that we're stuck in our own snow globe. I liked when uh, Pema Chodron, the, the wonderful Buddhist nun, said life is like, it's like we're standing in a river rather than standing on solid ground. Yeah. Life is like standing in a river versus it should like be. standing yes. On, yes. On, 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 on solid ground. Well, impermanence plays a huge role in helping us to deepen our understanding of this. And so if we apply that idea to the self, we know the self is not permanent, right? Right. Boom. Right. So then the self cannot be a thing. Boom. It can't be a thing because it can't be permanent. It can't be stable. It can't be repetitive. It is always changing. So what, what makes it so hard for us to get that? What do you think? Why is it so hard? Why do we come back to this issue again and again in the podcast? And well, I think it's easier for people to think of it from in terms of changing, you know, their narratives or their belief or their storylines. I don't really even I don't really know how to talk about it to be honest. You don't you don't yeah, quite know what the problem is that it's, people Yeah, it's like there's so, I don't know if it's just the term no self. I mean, dimensions of consciousness move in so many different ways, you know, and 
it's complex to deal with what contains us or how we hold our own containment. So let's say I rarely use the term no self. It's not yeah. a term that I think is helpful. Yeah, I so I, find, I you know I, I don't. I mean, a, I don't. I don't have an. I don't have a problem with understanding no self. I have a problem with what the connotation of no self. Well, let's say most people. First of all, I don't really like the term, but it comes from translating a couple of terms from Sanskrit, and then translating them particularly into Chinese, and then into Japanese and then into English. I mean, there were just, it was very difficult to figure out right. how to translate these terms right. that actually, so the term in Sanskrit is on Atman, A-N, yes, and then yes, Atman, yes. A-T-M-A-N, on Atman. It literally means the canceling of the self. It literally means like that interdiction sign, mm-hmm. the one that we use uh, mm-hmm. for our mm-hmm. icon on the mm-hmm. podcast. Mm-hmm over the self. Mm-hmm. So you have to actually believe Atman in order to do on Atman. Mm-hmm. You have to actually have a fixed sense in order to cancel the fixed mm-hmm. sense. And so the Buddha was trying to cancel the fixed sense of an unchangeable, permanent, right. stable soul right. that traveled right. lifetime to lifetime right. to lifetime. That, that I, I totally understand. I think that's very, very accessible for people. And, and I think it's a wonderful, a wonderful way of looking at life. So with the reason we come back to this, though, is you think that when we talk about it and we try to put it into practice, that people say, what, what? Mm-hmm. You know, and so the Buddha actually gave a lot, a lot, a lot of practices on it. Now, most of them boiled down to something that we call analytical practice, and a lot of people don't do it, which is look for this thing you call self. Where can you find it? Can you find it inside, outside? Where is it? And so if you do that, because in his culture, Atman was a big deal. So look for Atman. Where do you find it? That motivated people. In our culture, you say, look for yourself, and where do you find it? They go like, no big deal, it's in my body. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're not taking it as a spiritual challenge. Yeah, right. They're taking it more like, right. this is a weird way of thinking, no yeah. self. And so let me just tell you, I know where my self is. Right. And somebody said to me, I'd never want to lose it. Yeah. Because what if I lost one of my gloves and I never found the, it would, you know, basically... This person was confusing the self with a thing Mm. and believing that if you said you have no self, that you lose that thing and that would be a problem. Now, that whole way of thinking, it wasn't around when the Buddha was teaching because Atman was a big deal. So he was saying, no Atman. Where do you find Atman? Do you find it here? Do you find it there? That exercise worked well for back then. I don't think it works so well anymore. And so the reason, I mean, yes, it's a, it's a standard exercise and I've done it and I, I know that in fact you can't find it anywhere. But where I do believe we have more chance of affecting people at this period of time is to show that any, any experience you have of what you call yourself is always interactive with something else that you call either the other or the world. In other words, it's a dualistic experience. So you cannot have that sense of self without it being an interactional process with an other or others. And that interactional process includes all of your blah, blah about the others, all of your internal images about the others, all of your feeling sensations about the others. So by the time you come to actually trying to listen to that other, if you've got all of that stuff, you can barely, barely hear, feel, or see the other person. You've got your entire perceptual system loaded down with your own theory about what that person is like, what that person is doing, how they're motivated towards you, and what the consequences are going to be. So you're, that's what I'm calling your snow globe. It's like you're enclosed in the subjective experience of seeing out, seeing in, hearing out, hearing in, feeling out, feeling in. That is complex. That is not just your body. 
And that is a whole bunch of things. Well, the, the whole the whole system, yeah. It's like the a, whole system. It's the, like a holograph, the holism, all of all, all yeah, yeah. The, the multidimensional aspect of ourselves. So the interactional process, that's what I'm calling self. It's an interactional yeah. process. It is not your body. Right. But it is all of these things that are going on in your snow globe in which you're casting others into your drama, you're deciding what the others are about, you're, you're actually often motivated to act on something that you believe before actually experiencing the other person. And so this is a powerful thing, this subjectivity that we have. It is not like a no thing. It is actually powerful, but it is not a thing. It's an interactive process. It's a process. Self is a process. It's not located in your body, in your brain, outside of yourself, in your corpse. None of those places are where it's located. It's located in your activities as a subjectivity, as an individual homo sapien human being in which you can generate talk in your mind, you generate images in your mind, you generate body sensations, feelings, and then you also perceive on the outside. And you're often, all of us, confused about what's inside, what's outside. What am I doing? How am I, am I making somebody feel something? Or am I, are they making me feel something? Or am I generating that feeling myself? Is it based on an old idea I have about them? Is it based on, as I was saying, my mind saying, you know, that's a terrible outfit as I'm walking by somebody on the sidewalk. I'm not even thinking about their outfit, but I have a function in my mind, and many people do, that is a critic. But I happen to criticize visual things in the environment. I don't like the way certain things look, whether it's you know architectural or it's color or it's people's appearances. I've noticed this over the years, you know, and and sometimes it's useful if I'm trying to remodel a space. I have lots of ideas right. about it, but sometimes it's honestly just a pain in the neck to be walking down the street and hear this thing in the back of my mind talking about people's outfits, you know. It's obviously an old track in my internal tape, but I don't have to listen to it. But sometimes when I'm on retreat, when I do listen to it, it's a hilarious commentary. I mean, it's really funny because it's making comments about things I've never thought about. It's almost as though I have an internal companion back there in my speech center that just goes on and on about how things look. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's funny. So what I'm trying to say here is this is complex, this interactional process. It is defended by the sense that I'm in here and you're out there. But what am I in? I'm in the snow globe of my own subjectivity, which when it's shaken up and there's all this stuff going on, I'm then really responding to the way I hear things inside of my mind, what I'm saying about what should be true, about my feelings, my body sensations, about what's hurting or harming me. Those would be the feeling out sensations. And so what I'm responding to when I get shaken up or emotionally threatened, in order not to interact from an enemy perspective, I have to actually allow the snow to settle. That's the equanimity function. And then I can check. Then I can check. Did I really hear? Did I really see? Well, that's, Did a, I really... that's a very uh, awakened, mindful position to take. So the, I mean, that's yes. the best we can do. Well, it's, it's, I would say, what I look at, I'm a pragmatist at heart. I am not an idealist. And I am not particularly interested in anything that goes for what I would call perfect over good. But because I'm, I'm, you know, basically my feeling is either you actually do take that step back and notice what is going on in your snow globe, or you're dragged kicking and screaming through life. So what are the choices? The choices are either find some way to become mindful, to notice 
that you are generating an interactive process. It's not like you're just sitting there innocently in your body. You're doing a bunch of stuff and you're doing it in a way that really interferes with your ability to pay attention to others and to pay attention to anything around you. Because if you were paying attention, you would notice everything is changing all of the time. And so nothing is repetitive. So you're not stuck. And so we, we are then not stuck with Donald Trump. We're not stuck with who else would people feel stuck with right now? I mean, they, whoever they feel stuck with, those beings are changing. And so are we. And if we're stuck, it's only because we're stuck in our snow globe. We're stuck with a belief that we see, hear, and feel things accurately, which is impossible because we can't get out of the snow globe. Well, can you have preferences? Can you have points of view? You cannot help but have preferences and points of view. You're a homo sapien. Right. You have preferences and points. That's part of your design is to have preferences and points of view. It depends on how you, do you act on every preference? That's like a two-year-old. No, no, no. Okay, you could do that for your entire life. Or you could change and recognize, oh, I have preferences and desires, thoughts and feelings, ideas and opinions, and so do you. And so at this moment, do I want to foist my whole thing on you? Or do I want to take a step back and say, okay, here's what's going on in my snow globe. What's going on in yours? You know, what's going on from your side of the idea, position, argument, whatever. So in my view, it is not especially, let's say, wonderful that people can take a step back, but it's more like very necessary if you don't want to constantly be pushing and pulling right. on or the world, you keep pushing moving. things away, pulling things yeah, towards yeah. you. You keep right. matching energy and nothing. There's no chance for, for like a more evolutionary position or for something to allow for the possibility that we could do it differently. Something new yeah. to develop something instead new. of the right. repetitive, right. repetitive, right. repetitive. To be able to hold that kind of um, neutral place and be very centered in yourself and you know withdraw those projections. But at the same time, when you're looking at things that are terribly wounding or, or, or painful, painful or dysfunctional or bringing great harm, from my point of view, you, I also want to be very present with that as well. So, you know, I would say that there will never be a time in the world when there is not harming, wounding, and war. I do not think we can stop it. However, if you, don't you have to participate. if you, well, if you do, if you approach, I wouldn't even call it projection because it's the way we perceive things. We perceive things within the snow globe as though those are the things that are actually going on outside of ourselves. But there is somebody over there with a different snow globe. They perceive it very differently. And if you don't know that, then what will you do with those people? You have to get rid of them in some way. You have to somehow eliminate them because they absolutely go up against every feeling that you have about what is right and what is just. So if you are going to operate by your own thoughts and feelings and you are going to operate by what your mind is saying and that's it, you will be always in conflict with quite a few people, not just even one or two, but a lot of people. Now, if you want to live that way, it is very distressing to live that way, but some people do choose to live that way, so they're restless, they're distressed, they're never happy, really. And when we talk about the fog of war, we'll come back to this idea that if you are living in a constant state of having conflict and being against somebody, you won't actually even feel good in your own snow globe very often because your snow globe can get shaken up so easily. So, you know, there's another path other than the one of of, uh, the constant shaking up of your snow globe, but it is a path that requires as a very, very first step, the recognition that the human self is not contained inside of your body. 
It is not the same thing as your body and it is not the same thing as your brain. Now that that's the very, very first step. And as I said, when the Buddha began this thing, he began it with a whole language that suited his culture because he was saying, Ataman, no Ataman, on Ataman. We have a different feeling about this thing called self that we call self because it connects to our subjectivity. That is the experience that we have of being an individual human being, right? That experience of being an individual human being. Now, the, another interesting thing about this word self, if I have a hundred people in the room and I say, okay, guys, what's a self? I get a hundred different answers, except that some of the answers will focus especially on the issue of a body, that myself is inside of my body. That's something that, that many people do believe when you ask, you know, what is a self? They'll say a body. So, you know, but most people, if you press it beyond that, so where is it in the body? Well, they might say in the brain. But again, the thing is, when you ask for a definition of self, it is not well defined in anybody's mind, but we go around as though we know exactly what it is. Again, the reason I like interactional process is because right away it says the self is not a thing. It's a process. It's a way of engaging. What are you engaging from? You're engaging from your own experience of seeing, hearing, feeling. That's your subjectivity. That is the way you're engaging. It is habitual. And in order for you to recognize the way that it changes your perceptions, you have to get to know the habitual tendencies of your interactional process. Well, the other helps you with that. Well, of course, because that's where you have reactivity. And as long as you recognize that you actually need to have a very deep modesty about knowing what's going on, even with Donald Trump, even with Donald Trump, you may have a very strong feeling about it, very strong ideas, thoughts, and so on. But if you sat down with him and you had a conversation, you might conclude something very different from the thoughts and feelings you have from your own snow globe and the way your snow globe is interactive with the, you know, seven million other snow globes. It's like seven billion. I mean, it's like 7.7 billion. It's it's exhausting. uh, (laughs) 7.7 billion human beings on the earth. Every one of them, every one of them enclosed in their own experiences of a subjectivity. Well, that kind of reminds me of the sentence I read in the other day from a a Buddhist scholar where he said, there are 84,000 paths to liberation and freedom from self-delusion, according to Buddhism. That's partly so, because we have um, 7 billion. Yeah, so right. he could have said 7 billion, <laughs> but uh, 7 billion snow globes. Oh my now, goodness. Let, let me just say one more thing before we go. So this has been a conversation about the human self. This has not really been a conversation about Atman, just to be really, really clear about that. So what I am interested in doing in this period of time is helping people see that what they regard as their subjective self is not based on their bodies. And it's not accurate to say that it is someplace because it's a habitual way of interacting with the world and others from the perspective of your own subjectivity. Now, it's a slightly different conversation to get into about Atman and what the Buddha actually was aiming at with on Atman, but the reason I talk about the self is that it, Atman got defined as self in the West. That's, that's the language we use to try to teach this idea that there is no thing that is a self. And so I like to use interactive process 
Uh, yes, you can use the metaphor of a river. You can use the metaphor of the air. But, you know, most people do not really apply those to themselves. But when you begin to think that you see out, see in, hear out, hear in, feel out, feel in, inside of a protective snow globe of habit, and that you're taking that around everywhere, you begin to see this is a process that you use for interacting with others and the world. And that process isn't located anywhere. It's in your actions. It's in the ways that you interact. And so to me, this takes the Buddha's teaching about this into modern, let's say, cognitive science. It takes it into society in a way that does not go against any cognitive science that we know. And it takes it out of some of the formality of the teachings that are around on Atman. And yet there is another level, which I just want to recognize, which is the direct experience of on Atman. When you directly experience the impermanence, the interdependence, and the non-location of the deep presence that unites us, that would be more of the true experience of the Anatman. We're we're not going there exactly, but we're going towards the idea that the human self is interactive and it requires an environment of good relational skills in order to be healthy. That's where the healthy human self resides, is in an environment of good relational skills. Does so, that break the snow globe? This It actually allows you to do kind of like in the Truman Show, you know, when he gets to the of edge of his right. snow globe, you begin to see what your snow globe is doing. Right. I'm getting and like it, this whole science fiction scenario running yeah, in my no, mind. Yeah, no, you can, you can <laughs> get out of your snow globe, but I don't think you get permanently out. It's just like that. Well, you're that the awareness. You get the, the awareness, you that, the awareness. You, that you're in one, and yeah. so you don't get so yeah. held by it. Like, yeah. the, like the talk going in my mind telling me about other people's outfits that's really not relevant to me anymore. I imagine I developed that in junior high school, but you know, also it is a little bit entertaining. So I can get into listening to it almost like I'd be listening to an entertaining podcast or something if I want to. But I also notice when I do hear it that it's relentlessly negative. It it rarely sees an outfit that it likes, you know, although occasionally, but you know, mostly, mostly it's commenting and go, that doesn't work and that doesn't work. And again, I think that's really the homo sapien sort the of, of the noticing of what doesn't work. Yeah, first it doesn't work. You go to the appreciation. The, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. you know, in order to appreciate, really deeply appreciate other homo sapiens, you have to really deeply recognize what we're working with here. We are working with an organism that has a really big design flaw that is a tendency towards violence and aggression. And I did not really understand that so fully until about the last five years in reading Harari's book and then beginning to understand more deeply what I saw in psychotherapy and then understanding what I saw with couples. And then I thought, wait a minute, Everything is negatively oriented yeah. all of the time. Yeah. And that actually, I feel very big tenderness for the Homo sapien having been equipped this way. Because we could run around just killing each other forever. And it would seem like it's a good thing. No, I mean, when you I know. think about you going in to meet with your clients, it's like you're going into the war room. Yeah, I mean, with the so, couples. Yeah, with the couples. The yeah, couples yeah, are, yeah, yes, they are. Because you're dealing with so much. Uh, yeah. yeah. But again, the, the kind of radical, creative depth zone of, of, of all of this. And then going back from, you know, earlier on when you talked about the, 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 the relationship of love and hate. Yes. And how they, they go together. Yes. They arise together. They're not separate. And that when you really, truly understand love you know that it includes the hate. That's right. And all of that. That's and that's, right. those are, that's you know, right. one takes a really deep breath. I mean, that's yeah. big stuff. And that's, yeah. it potentiates a capacity that is so we're, we're in such need of right well, now in terms of yeah. what's going on in the world and the fact that we're just getting more and more separated out and more and more caught and yeah you know, i mean i think that that is what has motivated me to come 
to this podcast, to do a podcast. Yes. How In this period of time since we started the podcast, which is not yet a year, I think. A year the, in September, I think. In September, yeah. The world has changed just a little bit. I start to feel that there are other people like me who actually do see that the that we're poised to create enemies and that that is our nature that is not just the bad people out there that's who we all are and until we address ourselves within that we cannot actually move towards anything like even what i would call the rules of conduct in war i mean i i believe that it's possible to move to having rules about war, but we would have to stop assuming that the enemy is outside of ourselves. Well, we would we have to the, see it. Yeah, in the beginning of the journey to, to the inner world, that we have to go in and find a way to end the war within ourselves to be able to even imagine that we can do anything on the in the outer world. Well, so for me, what that means is investigating your snow globe. It yeah. doesn't mean yeah. just a sort of solitary look into yourself. No, not at all. But more like, you know, to, what are your your right, opinions or right, your feelings that right, get in the way? Right, exactly. Of you. That's the waking up. That's right. And so to see, first of all, that we are negatively motivated, that we are violent by nature. Again, I feel that there are now a handful of people out there who are also working with this and with the idea that you cannot quickly address the issues of war. You really first have to address the issues of human subjectivity, that is the human self, and then begin to work with that. And that that will lead in the end, to greater peace. Well, it's also, you know, when when Einstein, the famous quote from Einstein, when he goes, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. Right. It's really the transformation of your own mind. So we're also in this dialogue and in this experiment, yeah, opening the field. So, you know, I wanted to close with a quote from Mingyur Rinpoche, who um, is a Tibetan, a, a young Tibetan monk who's really quite well known, and who wrote a book called In Love with the World, A Monk's Journey Through the Bardos of Living and Dying. This book just came out just last week. The quote I want to read just for the conclusion to, of this podcast is, people everywhere try so hard to make the world better. Their intentions are admirable, yet they seek to change everything but themselves. Right. To make yourself a better person is to make the world a better place. Who develops industries that fill the air and water with toxic waste? How did we humans become immune to the plight of refugees or hardened to the suffering of animals raised to be slaughtered? Until we transform ourselves, we are like mobs of angry people screaming for peace. In order to move the world, we must be able to stand still in it. So... That standing still in it, in my view, is standing still in your snow globe, standing still with your own reactions and your own feelings and not acting on them, taking that step back that we talked about in the first podcast of decentering, taking the step back from your snow globe, seeing what's going on, and then deciding how do I want to respond here to talk here, to react here, recognizing that you have a freedom within yourself and that freedom is to not do your habit. That is your freedom. And there, that freedom does not belong to the other animals here. And they that's do also not have accountability and, and being responsible and, and all of those. Uh, is that an ethical stand to to you know have that sense of accountability to your actions and also to to realize consequences well it's your just... action when you're in that kind of negativity where you you know when you so that we can develop that you know that greater awareness and catch ourselves so you talk the, a lot about you know being the catching able to catch, catching, catching yourself yes. moment by moment yes. so that you don't have these long drawn drawn out you know hundred year war that you can catch yeah. yourself in the moment so it, the catching yourself again is is not acting it's like wait yeah wait yeah look at your own snow globe see if you actually are creating war 
yeah. by saying things, yes. by exposing yeah. somebody else's weaknesses, yeah. by saying something that could be read as humiliating yeah. to somebody else, and then take the step back and don't act until you check it for kindness, for yeah. truth, and for compassion, the things that we talked about how yeah. you can check. Yeah. And then you just have to just allow it because you can't control the outcome. You can't control the, you can't force an expectation on it. You have to just take a really, really deep breath. Yeah, it's more like stopping something yeah. and then yeah. checking yeah. and then deciding yeah. how do you want to speak here? Right. How do you want to act? Yeah. That's why you can't against... control the, how it's going to come back to you. No, but you, you know can control yeah, you can whether control you say yourself. something yes. or not. Yes, I, and, yes. And a lot of Buddhism is not saying very much. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. again, a lot of the early teachings, there's a lot of silence in them. Yes. Because, yes, yes, yes. because the creating yeah. of suffering yeah. and the creating of conflict yeah. is going to come through words mostly right. and, and then through actions yeah. beyond the words. And one of the things I just also, in, in concluding in the early days when I I would, you know, I had the privilege of sitting with the great Rinpoches. One of the things that they helped me to really, really undo was the conceptual mind. Mm -hmm. You know, so when one was caught by all of this and just like suffering in one snow globe, they would go into this very compassionate place with you and say, oh, dear, 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 you're so caught by your, you know, you're all tied mm -hmm. up in knots by your mm -hmm. by your concepts and, and all of this. And, so they weren't reacting yeah. to you no. at those moments. They were acting freely. Yes, and they, they were, but reacting. also that, that compassion of just allowing you to be where you were as well to kind of catch the reflection of your own being tied up in knots or your own confusion or your own things that you thought were so fixed or yeah. were solid and so you know again that that flexibility that comes when you when you truly you have awareness around impermanence or that constant changing it can change it can change yes Allowing and that's and again that's why the self is a process yeah. Yeah. it's not yeah. a thing it's an oh, interactive process yeah. it's always yeah. changing yeah. but it habituates yeah. to certain reactivity yeah. Yeah. and then it seems to yeah. be solid yeah. it seems to be something yeah. So that's yeah. it's a good place to end. Yeah, I and I, you know, I just want to just the last thing, you know, again, you know, back, you know, two decades ago when Joseph Campbell was in the world, and Joseph Campbell would say to us, "We're not on our journey to save the world, but to save ourselves." But in doing that, we save the world. Mm -hmm. And so, on that note. We'll end. Okay, <laughs> Thank Eleanor. you, Polly. Yes. This was very yes. uh, uh, dense. <laughs> <laughs> So soon I will be teaching at the Rowe Conference Center. It's in Rowe, Massachusetts. And I will be offering two different programs. One is a couples retreat program, which is on the weekend of October 4th and 5th, 2019. And that's for anybody who wants to participate. You can check on the Roe website, R-O-W-E. And then I will be presenting as well a foundational training in dialogue therapy that begins on Monday, October 6th and goes to October 11th. That first segment is a five-day program. It's part one of a two-part certificate training in dialogue therapy. And this training program is for any therapist who wants to enhance skills for couples therapy or wants to learn to do dialogue therapy, or for non-therapists who want to learn this training in order to become a real dialogue specialist. And we talked about real dialogue on several of the podcasts. The first week of the training is October 6th through 11th, 2019. And then the second week is March 6th through 11th, 2020. March 6th through 11th, 2020. And so this model of therapy based on real dialogue, and it's a structured, time-limited form of couples therapy that draws on psychoanalysis, mindfulness, and psychodrama. It can be applied to couples in conflict and couples who are having especially difficulties with their intimacy, as well as to other dyadic relationships where there's difficulties with repetitive conflicts. Uh, in the training, you'll be learning in lots of different ways through mindfulness practices, dyadic exercises, videos, lecture, intensive sessions, 
and you will learn about lots of different things, including the nature of personal love, challenges of equality, reciprocity, and mutuality, and the enemy factors in personal love. So there's lots more to the training, but if again, if you check on my website, www.youngeisendrath.com, or if you check on the Row website, you will get the details for the training program October 6th through 11th, 2019, and then March 6th through 11th, 2020 for the full certification. And the uh, couples retreat precedes the weekend before that October 6th date. So I hope to see you there. I always look forward to the training. We learn a lot together, and it's also a lot of fun. Thanks so much for listening. And to continue the conversation, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find past episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and CastBox. Enemies from War to Wisdom is recorded and produced by Chris Coltrane.